welcome to the show, episode two of, I think last episode I said, Ye Old John Adams Review Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Dollimore. And I'm Ian Brinksman. And this is Ian Brinksman, the one and the only. And I'm, am I talking to the mic? You are okay, talking, good, you're good, talking good. into the mic. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I had some notes. Am listeners. I giving you too much shit? Is that the deal? Well, look. <laughs> To, to to the my fellow ADHD sufferers out there, the amount of violence Jesse has uh, oh. has thrown our way. <laughs> like, just I hope at some point you'll start judging us through the content of our character. Oh, um, is that it? But you know what? Well, until we get to that point, listen. My metric of someone's worth, Ian Brinkman, mm-hmm. is uh, whether or not they speak correctly into an SB. Uh, a sure uh, SB well, I, microphone. Yeah, my worth is not high, um, <laughs> but I am I am making every effort not to bounce back and forth to stay reasonably upright and yeah to do a good job. Thanks, man. See, I what I didn't it. want to do mm-hmm. is because you know when you do this for a living mm-hmm. and you fortunately this is not what you do for a living, you it just becomes yeah it's not an awkward thing to yeah, be in yeah, the microphone. Yeah. Yeah, so. sure. It's not the. It's weird. I don't mind talking in front of a mic. I have the. I, I have the right brain disease where I can just sort of talk confidently and not worry about it. It's the actual physical moving around that I I struggle with. But yeah. well, yeah. Y- y- it, it worked out. Yeah. It, the, the the episode turned out fantastic. I'm sure the audience would agree. In fact, that leads me to the to initiate or solicit communication from the audience we have an email address specifically for the show it is info at john adams podcast i would uh encourage you to contact us to ask a question make a comment you can also call the regular phone number for the dollamore daily show which is 714-576-4054 this episode number two of seven yep uh is entitled independence and uh they got right to it they did indeed yeah it was and it despite getting right to it pretty long episode i surprisingly long i just watched it again today you know i'm re it's not like we're out of memory from years ago we're yeah. re-watching these episodes obviously and i was laying on the couch while watching and then i would sit up and then take notes and <laughs> i kept multiple times pausing like when in the hell is this thing going to be over? Listeners, it's an hour and a half. <laughs> we watched a damn movie. <laughs> um, well, there was a lot to cover. There was a lot to cover. This was, And this was the whole, basically, his time in what would become known as Continental Congress. First and second First Continental and Congress second, they covered. Yep, yeah. Yep, yeah. Which yep. is, I wish, it, it is something that I wish they would do a better job of, and that is... Put more dates on the screen Mm -hmm. to indicate where we are in history. I know a lot of people don't know the difference between the First and the Second Continental Congress. It was only a year between the two. Uh, One was September and October of 74. The next was like April or May of 75. But still, you'd like to know where we are in history. Speaking of that, they did correct the age discrepancy of the sons, of the children. Oh, did they? I didn't notice that. I mentioned it last episode. Yeah. It was 1770. John Adams would have been a toddler. John Quincy would have been a toddler, mm. and and uh, Charles would have been a, a an infant. And here we are, five years later, and the kids are the same age. It's like a Simpsons episode where the kids just never age. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and also uh, our boy John uh, happened upon a lot of historic events that I don't think he was there for as well. So uh, I, I actually did think that. Are you talking oh. about when the the surveying the the carnage? Yeah, of, yeah he yeah. actually went the next day. Oh, I didn't. I, I thought that I in my note in my handwritten notes. Wow, I wrote wrong, and then I went to look, and in fact he was okay, not there for the battle. Yeah, but he did survey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. after the fact. After the yeah, fact. a little sit rep. Post 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 kinetic action, which is an interesting thing that you know we in today's day and age we we kind of lionize military service mm-hmm. and that's a, a requisite for for being a politician or a leader politically or whatever culturally, and really none of these guys that we talk about were I mean they were fancy fancy yeah, they ones. were the fanciest of the fancy lads yeah. and I think that's actually something the show gets really gets right really well especially when we get introduced to thomas jefferson which we'll talk about but like 
very effete. They, they, they play him so effete. <laughs> which is Yeah, so foppish. And again, <laughs> as a foppish dandy lad myself. <laughs> dandy, that's the other uh, one. <laughs> I, I appreciate representation. It's, yeah. it's needed. Well, what they didn't represent, we're all over the place right now. We'll get to the narrative here sure. in a minute, yeah, the yeah. linear narrative. <laughs> um, <laughs> the thing I don't like that they didn't represent well is that they don't really portray him as the, as the, the, the fellow ginger that he was. Oh. It's, he's only like maybe a little bit red, a little bit strawberry blonde. I was unaware of this historical discrepancy. I didn't realize he was a member of the community. Oh, oh yeah. He yeah, was yeah, a ginger. Yeah. Were yeah. there other ginger presidents I wasn't aware of? Oh, I, what am I? The chronicler of the I mean, gingers? I, I you, are you not the ginger mayor? I have no I, idea. Uh, okay. I just know that about, I know that about Thomas Jefferson, that he, yeah. one, he was redheaded, two, and they do make reference to this in this episode that well, I think what's the the quote that he has no gift for, God, for oratory. Just look at us. Look at us. We are so well aligned. Because he's trying to, John Adams is yeah. trying to convince him to, to he's like, hey, listen, why, you're, if you're with me on my side and you agree with me, why aren't you coming out and saying, and he said, um, I have no gift for oratory. Yeah, and, and that is actually very accurate. Like he was known to be, and I write this down, he was known to be a god awful public speaker. Yeah. Just, just fidgety, fidgety and quiet, flat. And, yeah, yeah, no yeah, affect. Yeah. yeah. Which is maybe a great place to start here is is really it opens with with uh, John Adams being very irritated in the first Continental Congress mm -hmm. at the the bombacity and the, the the flourishing language and how proud of themselves they were that no one really wanted to get anything done in his estimation. They just wanted to show how great of speakers they and were. And he responds by then doing his own bombastic, oh, yeah. flourishing <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. speech. Yeah. Well, going back to what we were talking about previously about the oratory skills of, of mm -hmm. Thomas Jefferson, he, uh, he says in that conversation... That uh, I'm not known for my humility. I'm not a humble man. It's yeah. not one of my skills, yeah. but blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Because I would, he's telling him what a great writer he is. That, yeah. you know, I'm not known to be super humble, but I'm in awe of the, the flourish of your pen or some sure. nonsense yeah, 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 yeah. 18th century language. Yeah, yeah. But so that's where they start. John Adams is very irritated at the, the proceeding um, while they're discussing the, an organized, put on paper boycott of British goods uh, that the colonists would not take part in buying anything. And they're going to send a, a, a declaration to the Strongly king. Strongly worded letter to, right, to yeah, the manager. They're going to fire off an they're, email yeah, to the manager. They're, and they're 18th century Karens, essentially. It, it, that's exactly right. Yeah. And it's so interesting because they say, he says, I, I wrote it down, um, while they're discussing the proclamation and the, the boycott effort. And he says, the, about the boycott effort, John Adams kind of snidely under his breath, which no one will honor. And then when they talk about the proclamation, Samuel Adams says, uh, which his majesty will not read. Right. So like, this is all feudal bullshit because yeah. this doesn't work. And they really show, and this is, I think, a storytelling device. Obviously, we talked about this last episode. It's not really true to reality <laughs> that uh, he's... The switch has been made from episode one to episode two. He he was kind of a curmudgeon or a reluctant participant in the revolution, yeah. as they predicted, which is wrong, yeah. as they uh, depicted him. And now he's almost like the the surly, fiery change agent who's even embarrassing Samuel Adams at the dinner at John Dickinson's house. Yeah, we'll get. I think we'll get there because I do think that is. I think that's both the writer and the director making a broader political point, which yes. I, I do want to get to. But but ye, but yes, all of a sudden, kind of out of nowhere, he is on the vanguard of independence. Right, right. at this point, the independence is not supposed to be on the table. But he represents a faction that's saying, like, no, anything short of a full separate political uh, 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 separation of ties. Uh, will will be worthless. We have to go for this full this full emancipation, which wasn't. And I do think they do a, a a decent enough job of communicating this that it at the time people always just they look at it as this is it's a done deal. We look at it as as something that just was accomplished, and this was the goal in mind the entire time. And that's not at all the case. Even up until months before the Declaration of Independence, they were looking to compromise and can maintain their British British uh, citizenship or or ties as as British uh, subjects yeah they, they they constantly refer to themselves as Englishmen in this until they 
don't. Yeah, even even uh, the dinner at John Dickinson's house, which there were characters like he and John Rutledge, mm -hmm. uh, which we'll get to. Yeah, the, the South Carolina delegate. Yeah, who never signed on. That's another thing the show gets wrong. But um, even in in when John Dickinson gives the toast at dinner, and he at the end of it he says, "God save the king." Yeah, and they all say, "God save the king." And John Adams, he also says it, but he's it it's it's Paul Giamatti pulling on that full just sass, and it <laughs> it is wonderful. Great performances from him this episode. Great performances from him again has this ability to be bombastic, kind of just again, that Sorkian oration, uh, incredible performances. Yet I would say not the best performance this this week from who. From Mr. Adams, from our boy Paul Giamatti. Great, great. He was amazing. Yeah, yeah. One performance stood out above it for me, personally. Well, what's that? That was our boy Ben Franklin, <laughs> and we can get there. Um, uh, Wait, let's get there um, after the conversation that he has with John Quincy. Yeah. Because I did, because an element of this show that doesn't get talked about enough, not like I'm in a bunch of circles that talk about this show a lot, but... What are you talking about? The, the Everywhere we go, people are like, Jesse, Ian, let's sit down, get into it. I want to know your thoughts on the Stamp Act. And I'm like, sir, this is a Wendy's. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> um, what doesn't get talked about a lot is the, the relationship between John Adams and his sons. Mm -hmm. And this, they gave a little bit of a flavor of it last time with how harsh he was with Charles and how like instructive he is to John Quincy. And then it shows up a little bit more this time where he and John Quincy are out like putting their hands in cow shit. And he's talking about his recipe for good manure and that it's 50% this and oh, this much salt and it's an art. And I'm one of the greatest artists. It's kind of, it's a funny scene, Yeah, but he, he says, I want to be a farmer, papa. <laughs> Ugh, that's the worst. And and he says, no, you're going to go to school. He, yeah, oh, farming yeah. is noble work, the noblest of it all, yeah, he says. Yeah, yeah. But you're going to go to school and for the law just like I did. Yeah. Just telling him what he's, I mean, that, that's the, the era. Tells him what he's doing, but yeah, and also shows some of the, I think I, I missed it until you're saying it just now, but the sort of hypocrisy that exists with all these guys, right? Like this veneration of the farmer. Right. But- um, no, we're better than that. Right. right? Well, I mean, so in some ways, it hasn't changed. No. It's, it's the no. same with these virtue signaling dipshits on Capitol no. Hill yeah, yeah. who want to act like, we got to save the American farmer while they br breach every trust oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. oath they've ever made. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, no. It, it's, no, that's a very good point. At least the morons today, at least they're not like homework dorks. You know what I mean? Like, I really believe that they don't do shit when they go home and they're just sort of, they turn the lights off. Whereas, like, some of the founding fathers, I think what annoys me so much about them is they're like, well, the world needs me to read and it needs me to tell them all the fancy stuff I know. Let me, yes. let me tell you about Rome. Yes. You know, it's just like, shut the fuck up. Even, <laughs> even there's a scene even where he starts yammering on about the Demosthetes, or you know, yeah, I'm, that's not my era. I don't know that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even the guys in the room are like, ugh, enough yeah. <laughs> with the Greek and the, what are you doing, dude? <laughs> it, it's so it's so funny as they're in the Continental Congress and like I find myself, how to say this? I find myself sort of agreeing with John Dickinson a little bit as oh, they're going really? through it. I'm kind of like, you know what? He's got a point. You're going to convert to Quakerism? You're going to be a I mean, Quaker? Yeah, A, I kind of... A peace Nick? I, you know what? <laughs> I think we what we need is a Quaker president. I think, We already had one. His name was Nick, yeah, Nixon. That was, yeah, that was the joke I was oh, going sorry, it's, sorry, No, it's all right. Sorry. It's fine. It's fine. You know what? It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Tell your joke. No, 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 no. <laughs> what, it's, but yeah, he's just going to be like, you know, just because then they'd be all into like peace and never say bad words and things like that. Uh, but no, I... I because the the whole idea that like that the point they had gotten to the point where no too many things have happened and we have to do this violent war of independence and and people like uh like Dickinson played by the great uh, character actor who his name I always screw up yeah it is a tough and this one. is really this is really embarrassing because I am Balkan and I know it and yet I I I am worried about saying him. I'm going to try uh, Zlatko Ivanic all right. 
Uh, the J's are usually silent, but or they can be a Y, and, and it's never know what which That's, one it is. But he's a great character actor. Every time I see him, I get happy. He, he's very good. Yeah, he's, he usually plays like sniveling bureaucrats. That's his sort of bread and butter in most roles. But this one, he played just a very subtle, kind of decent-seeming guy. And yeah, I I mean, we, we part ways on how we're going to venerate John Dickinson, because I think he... He was an impediment to progress. He was an impediment to what now maybe I'm doing the thing that I chastise people for doing and looking at it as a done deal. Mm -hmm. But even in the end, when they signed the Declaration of Independence or or motioned to to have a Declaration of Independence, he had to be in absentia. He wasn't there. Yeah, but I but I guess my point to you and you're, you'll probably reflexively disagree with, but. I don't think it had to be a done deal. Like I, I don't think they, they these 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 intolerances were so much you had to have a civil war. I think, and I don't think all but of them. Once blood was shed, it, it seems a done deal. So I mean, it wasn't a done deal in the in the idea of like most people who we would now call Americans, right? It was a done deal in these guys' heads, but these guys wanted this, right? And they were happy that blood was shed a lot of them because it gave them an excuse to push for their political project. And 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 that's that's what I'm saying. Like, to a degree that might I, to a degree that might be true. Yeah. I, I wouldn't disagree with that. I, I just think that there was uh, th there was more of a a moral intent and and um idea behind what they were doing than just we're rich and we don't want to pay taxes no which yes is often, i totally agree it's a reductive no, yes, i yeah. totally agree i don't think it's just they're rich and don't want to pay taxes i do think a lot of it comes back to the fact that they've read a lot of books on rome and were really excited and the enlightenment this is yeah, the middle sure. of the english enlightenment and they were really excited to try it out well they they certainly you're absolutely you're 100 percent correct in, i mean this is undisputed that they truly believe they were going to change the world by this new form of government that they were going to put forth. Yeah. And they were the change agents. They were the ones yeah. that they, they, John Adams certainly thought a lot of himself. Oh, for sure. He did have an ego. Yeah. He was, uh, you know, and he wasn't alone. They all did. Yeah. For the most part. Yeah. yeah I think so. The main guys anyway. The heavy hitters. Yeah. I was going to make a comment about, uh, George Washington. Uh, that's true. That's a good point. Well, uh, I get I'm getting conflicting ideas this this next time that I'm watching it because he really does seem to be they portray him as how he's been mythologized as the guy who's always humble and never thinks of himself and everything else but when Thomas when when John Adams goes and tells him that you've just been given command of the Continental yeah. Army that we just made because it wasn't a thing yeah, before, right, right. he there there's a flash of excitement on his face like happiness yeah and I don't know how how that aligns with the historicity of the of the actual moment, but he he uh, George Washington absolutely made an effort throughout his life to stand a certain way, act a certain way, comport himself a certain he way would, yeah. because he knew image conveyed the goodest good boy to ever live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was his thing. That's why he stopped being president. He was tired of people being mad at him. <laughs> he's he's <laughs> like, I'm a good boy. You should like me. <laughs> Uh, and I don't remember if we talked about this last time. That's how he died. Did we talk about this? I can't remember. I think it might have. That's the problem. We, we, talk, we about talk about this shit about this so often. often. <laughs> yeah. Well, real quickly, uh, he, you know, he, there was a rainstorm. He he's, came inside. He had dinner, dinner guests waiting. His coat got wet. And he insisted, no, I've made my guests wait long enough. I won't take off my coat. I'll sit at dinner. So he just sat there soaked, caught a cold. Um, they say he died from something like a throat like infection, but it turned out he also just got bled like eleven quarts yeah. of blood. So he, which is which is something that gets mentioned in the the the, the bar. Yeah, with Benjamin Frank Franklin when when John Adams comes up to him and he's talking to one of the doctors. Yeah, and he says something about bleeding half of of Philadelphia and the the desanguination he calls, oh. calls it. What a t listen, this is an aside. You just got me to it. What a terrible, horrific time to be alive. Awful. And they really Awful. capture it in the makeup in yeah. this episode, too, yeah. because they're in, like, th th this episode, uh, it's not just an hour and a half. It also spans winter months and summer months. Yeah. And it is sweltering and humid in Philadelphia in the summer. And they're all 
way too many layers and I'm a guy who loves to wear layers. You do love it's layers. It's too much. Yeah, yeah. They're all sweaty and they've got zits. You're a guy who wears layers when it's too warm to wear layers. Right? <laughs> and and then you complain about the heat. That is a uh, this is this is a particular Jesse specific. Listen, I got to have something to complain about. Yeah, no, it's who uh, whom amongst us. <laughs> but no, you're so right cuz when it shows it's sweaty, you can smell that room. Oh, yeah. You can just smell it, and it's not a good way. And they're not all fit, either. The dude no, from New no. York, who's played by Ed Jewett. Uh, oh, yeah. He's just, uh, just a... He's a he's a he's, he's a, got some girth to it. He's got a ham like quality yes. to him. Oh yeah. yeah, he's you know that guy's breath smells like honey ham. Oh, uh, and <laughs> yeah, 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 and and like and the other thing too, like bathing, like they were upper class, they bathed, but you know, not every day, not every day, maybe once a week. I and bet they were big into like perfume, oh, <laughs> and so yeah. that kind of, just 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 imagine that soup, listener. That is what. Uh, yeah, listen. It... <laughs> It is not, that is not a good smell. No. If you add perfume to crotch smell, yeah. then it's just a perfumey crotch smell. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's, it doesn't mask anything. I, I, I like my crotch smell sweet. I don't know, I don't know about you. I think that's nice. You don't like musky crotch smell, no, you like I want, sweet? I like it sweet, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it starts <laughs> sweet, ends ends musky. I think that's the, that's the right, that's the right, that's the right combo. So there was a scene, and this will get us to the next, where we we get introduced to Ben Franklin. But there was a scene right before they cut to the Second Con Continental Congress, where Lexington and Concord had just happened. Um, the, 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 the you know the gunning down of of, of American colonists, militia people, mm -hmm. and he goes back after having witnessed what took place the yeah. day after, and he's having a conversation with Abigail and. He does. I. It's to me. It's a. You know. I'm a crier. So sure. I didn't cry watching it this time. This yeah. time. But yeah. Giamatti is such a fucking amazing actor. His the little chin quiver, and he's mm -hmm. he's like you. They're conveying how much he really does care. He's not like yes, we can finally get to independence. He's like my countrymen have been killed. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So uh, amazing actor. Uh, yeah. For sure. Yeah. Just incredible. Again, a god in a perfect role. And you would think perfect role, perfect role. Can't imagine anyone else. And you would think could not be upstaged. And yet, I propose to you, he was upstaged in every scene with with the other god, Tom Wilkinson. Tom Wilkinson. Yeah. R.I.P. Yeah. R.I.P. Yeah. To him and his baguettes. I love that man so much. And Remarkable. He, he crushed it. Every. Do you think everybody's going to get the Michael Clayton joke? I don't. I think they should. <laughs> Stop what you're doing. Do not. Stop. Do not. You, pause this. <laughs> Go put on Michael Clayton right now, 2007. Don't don't look at just just enjoy it. The year before this. The year before this, and then come back and join us, and you will have such an. Uh, did, did, watch Michael Clayton. Email us. Tell us how much you love those baguettes. That's right. Throw that in there. So. Uh, Tom Wilkinson is, or Ben Franklin, is introduced to us right away when they cut to the Second Continental Congress. Yeah. And he comes out making this loud, garish speech about the these reprobates from Boston, these Massachusetts radicals. And right. it's like, oh, what is this guy going to do? And he's like, how dare you defeat the British and be awesome? And, yeah. and Rutledge, who's a guy that you get introduced to here, too. Mm -hmm. John Rutledge from South Carolina ended up being a governor in South Carolina, um, opposed independency the, the entire time. South Carolina has always been weird. Yeah. It's always been weird. They were the Tory stronghold. That's part of why, um, you know, the, the British were there for so much. It was obviously Fort Sumter. It's always been just like a little, yeah, just a little strange. Yeah. Same with to the South Georgia, which was set up as a, an organized economy, and yes. it was almost like indentured servitude for... Yeah, it was a penal colony. Yeah, and yeah. then they... Anyway, so so he gives the speech, and it's this great moment between he and John Rutledge where he says, like, uh, John Rutledge says, must you be so extreme, uh, Mr. Franklin, all the time? And, and Tom Wilkinson goes through this thing about, um, I am an extreme moderate. It's the same campy... Yes, yes. Folksy stories you always hear yes. Ben Franklin telling. But I'm an extreme moderate. 
Mr. Rutledge, I believe anybody not in favor of moderation and compromise ought to be castrated and that all this and then he motions to his dick and balls should be sent down to the parliament. They seem to need some stones. I think think that is the (laughs) philosophy of this episode, at least, and maybe this whole show. And that's like politically at least. And I disagree with that vehemently, but I found myself being like, you know what, Ben Franklin, you're right. You got Sorkin. I got Sorkin <laughs> because this, and like just the, he, he showed up. Tom Wilkins doesn't really look like Ben Franklin. I think he was 59 when this was, when, when this was recorded, like not that old of a guy. Yeah, Franklin was in his seventies. In his seventies. Yeah. Uh, you know, Tom Wilkins has got a full head of hair, blah, blah, blah. But he just, became ben franklin yeah and just a decision i don't he i don't i don't quite pick up the type of english accent he chose you i use i think it's cornwall don't know why he picked it hmm. but i love it it's something different that just tom went with and i was like yeah that's what ben franklin sounded like that's his accent it is interesting that you mentioned the accents because it, it's another layer of complexity to the casting and how they how they produce the show that they really did show the wide breadth of culture yeah that yeah every they were all white dudes but they came from different religious traditions they came from you know similar but slightly different cultural perspectives on like every religious group that that left uh europe they 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 emigrated to to the colonies and went to different places yeah so like the huguenots ended up in like Pennsylvania and the Quakers. Yeah. You had your Puritan assholes up in New England. The weird Catholics they, in Maryland. Yeah, they had yeah. really a completely different idea about how to do things. So it, it, it was a struggle. They <clears throat> even through the accents, they 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 depict, they they show that it's it wasn't an easy road. No, no. So I, I do like the Ben Franklin um how he's portrayed in this. Yes. Although I think historically he gets a pass too much because there, there's a moment, and I think it's right here, we just happen to be here, where he indicates to John Adams that, yes, I'm for I'm for all the things you're saying. And then um, I think it was about the olive branch or something they were going to send to the king, and he voted in the opposite way that he told John Adams he would. Mm-hmm. And John Adams went up to him in the bar that was just talking about the desanguination. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, hey, what What are you doing, dude? Yeah. And then he's like, well, what are, what are you going to do if you piss all these people? Like, he's acting. We love him now because it all worked out. But it very well could have because he wasn't communicating directly. Yeah. He's, with his stupid stories and his folksy well, bullshit. It's, it's that. It's also about, like, you know, the only way you get good things is through compromise and is yeah. through is through like meeting people where they are halfway and not insulting them and not debasing them and like this it's because he had that other thing too when after uh um after Adams dresses down uh Dickinson right about mm-hmm. his implying that his Quaker religion yeah. is what's causing him to they were all oh, harum yeah yeah and and Franklin dressed him down for that it's like yeah you could tell i don't have the quote but he's like something about like you could tell him that in person and he might not even keep you can insult somebody in private yeah that's perfectly fine to do yeah but if you insult them in public they're prone to believe you mean it yes is what he said yeah right yeah right yeah. and it's like i understand the point trying to be driven home there and then you see later adams then kind of moderates and he builds yeah. he builds consensus and it's it's it, it's about you know what you're right. We shouldn't allow the extremes on both sides to get at it. We we need to come together in the middle. Right, right, right. And and like this would then come to define you know the oncoming Obama administration and really like Democrats. Well, it, no, listen, it could have been it could have been right for the time. It's not right for today. No, I mean this is this is hundreds of years pre Nazis. This is hundreds of years pre some of the, the most terrible shit that we. I mean it was. It's also the same attitude they had about slavery and the enslavement of millions yes, yeah, of, yeah, of Africans yeah. and the brutal torture, rape, and murder of this population. Oh, but progress in due time, everybody. Well, I mean, that, I mean, that is what's so annoying about them generally is because every single founding father, there wasn't a single founding father who said they were pro-slavery, even the guys in the South. Even they, the slave, the enslavers. Even the enslavers, Jefferson, Washington, all of them, they were aghast at slavery. A horrible system, disgusting. It's so bad they have to do it, but they have to because, you know, just the country needs it. We need to stay together and yeah. it'd be too difficult to unwind. But the good thing is, 
you know, it'll eventually solve itself. Right. You know, <laughs> 10, 20 years, the problem will go away. I don't know what pie in the sky thinking that is. So, because... the, so the, the, the thing I actually do know, the thinking was that at the time it was cotton was, or sorry, it was tobacco was right. the big cash crop. And the soil had already started to go bad, right? You can't just use one, the same cash crop in the soil over and over again. They ruined it because of capitalism. Yes. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that's a greed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll we'll talk about our boy <laughs> next episode. I think that's when uh, ha- Alexander Hamilton shows up. Yeah, yeah, because um, he's a kid at this point. Yeah, this, yeah right. Yeah, he's yeah. a kid at this point. But a um, little foreshadowing. Um, <laughs> but but then you know they assume because of that you know the need for slavery would go away and it wouldn't be economically viable. Did they think in a generation? Yeah, because that because tobacco would basically be useless. Mm. And so what they did not foresee is cotton right and then uh the early parts of the industrial revolution making cotton so much more productive to make yeah yeah, yeah. and so all of a sudden like slavery became more valuable than at any time prior and it exploded right in, in profitability and need so no that that wait sometimes i think listeners the uh the lesson here is don't kick the can down the road assuming things will all work out well i mean listen we've been conditioned <clears throat> excuse me we've been conditioned as americans to to, to think about compromise as this great yep. endeavor yep. That, that it's a it's a salve for the soul and it's it's this bomb that will it'll cure what ails you yeah it's the desanguination is what it is. Yeah. And it will bleed you. Oh, wow. That was a hell of a callback. And I, yes. Sometimes yeah, I you, pull it off. You just, you just, <laughs> you just dead stick landed that thing beautifully. I am impressed. It, uh, That's why you're a professional. It, 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 it is, uh, sometimes it is uh, uh, a curse. For sure. It's an evil. Yeah, because usually it's poor people who get screwed over, right? Yeah, it's it's usually it's it's the things that they can compromise on are usually the things that uh, materially uh, hurt them the least. Yeah, um, and 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 yeah, and I think maybe too, I do think because this came out at the end of the Bush administration, and the Bush administration were known as cowboys and combative and never working with anyone. I think that this is sort of a subtle nod to that as well. I would, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I think it's been in, it's been a, a, a blight on the body politic in America for a long time. That yeah. my good friend across the aisle, you hear these dipshits in Congress acting like they're such great friends. There was a senator from South Carolina, coincidentally yeah. enough, named Fritz Holling, who used to he had that big booming the foghorn leghorn yeah, voice yeah, yeah. and it, it's the, the thing because he always was talking about his good friends across the aisle he was a democrat mm-hmm. but he would talk about you know my good friend strom thurman the the insane racist segregationist by no, was, by also called him a good friend yeah of course he did yeah, yeah, yeah. i mean yeah. that, that it, it's the same culture yeah that that we still venerate when it, it's but again it but weirdly useless. it's always the Democrats who are the ones who are right. compromising the Republicans seem to never do it and that they get what they want it's this weird thing I yeah, don't yeah, yeah. really understand it I want so <laughs> I mean we could do a second show yeah <laughs> uh, if only I had a show where I talked about politics yeah, modern day politics that'd be, yeah that'd be, that, we sh- I should look into doing we should that. look into that <laughs> yeah yeah like, I think you'd go far we let's let's jump ahead to in the moment where Ben Franklin is uh, dressing down, as you put it, uh, John Adams, he he insists that he seek out the gentleman from Virginia, is how he refers mm-hmm. to him, and that's Thomas Jefferson. Yep. Because if they're going to seek this declaration of independency, which is referred to a, a few times, they need someone to write it, and they need someone also from the South. So it's not just this Massachusetts radicals who yeah. are running the show here. Because up to this point... Really, the most egregious actions against the colonies taken by Britain have been on the Massachusetts colony. Yep. The the, the death toll is there, both the, the Boston Massacre and Lexington and Concord. Yeah, that's a good point, too, because at this point, they were not viewing themselves as one body politic. Right? Which is something we, we forget. Yeah. We yeah. think this is the United States speaking, and no. No, no, no. Every colony had its own interest. Every colony had its own... Um, nuanced economy. It wasn't just, oh, Massachusetts is in trouble. We're all Americans. Yeah. We're going to go run up there and save yeah. the day. Completely would never have thought that way. So they go to Thomas Jefferson to yeah. write the the Declaration from of Virginia. The most, the largest, most important 
uh, colony by far. Yeah. Um, it's a reason why then most populous, most populous and, yeah. and, uh, richest richest. It's a reason why like all except for Adams next presidents were from Virginia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yes, they come to our boy, Thomas Jefferson played by the great Stephen Delane. Most of you will know him as Stannis Baratheon from game of Thrones. That's right. Yeah. 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 Uh, playing a very different role and Stannis, and Stannis was very stern and man, a few words, uh, and yet here he plays quite the opposite. I think he plays it really well. I do too. I love this performance. In, in fact, um, I, I don't know if we want to jump all the way ahead to the, him writing the Declaration of Independence. I think we should cover when they're um, when they're declaring independence and the argument for independence, where he's arguing actually with John Rutledge from South Carolina, yeah. someone who is probably not a coward, but I'm going to go ahead and call I him a coward. I love how... 250 years later, you are just... I'm hold a grudge, Yeah, man. you like, fuck that guy. He's also... He mm-hmm. is portrayed as the most foppish. Yes. As the most yes. dandy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he may as well have the white face powder yeah, on like the French. it is shocking he doesn't have the, the powdered... Yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. He even speaks with his handkerchief mm-hmm. waving it around mm-hmm. in the air and mm-hmm. shit. Mm-hmm. I feel, there, I feel he, very attacked right he now. He says... <laughs> he said... John Adams says to him that, listen, we need to go and... um. And, and request help from King Louis from France. Yeah. And they all laughing at him. And, he, and he's like, well, he's not going to recognize us. And he's like, yeah, well, he's, John Adams says, he, they'll never recognize us unless we recognize ourselves yeah. as our own sovereign power. And until we do that, we're on our own. And that, I think, was a, a brilliant point that moved the room, not John Rutledge, but it moved the room. Yeah, and I, I think that that shows... It, you know, they don't say it in, in the show, but I think that really highlights that, like, Adams was not a particularly important president. And it, sure. He was not even particularly important after this moment. But, like, at this period, in the two Continental Congresses, he is probably the most important founding father. He is the one, probably one most um, responsible for getting... Like taking every step necessary to declare independence and then stick with it. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think this this really shows that very well. And I was smart by the filmmaker to spend so much time here. Yeah, and I also think. and also just in in the the reality of it, there's a lot to say that's negative about John Adams. Oh yeah, but a fucking brilliant man. Oh yeah, without a doubt, a brain pan on this guy. Yeah, very smart dude. But in this in this the dialogue with John Rutledge, he says that about. Uh, we have to recognize ourselves or they won't recognize us. And then John Rut- Rutledge says, uh, I-, I wrote it down, um, we will not vote for independence, Mr. Adams. Not now, not ever. Uh, which is, you know, fast forward 15 minutes later in the episode and it's something they got wrong. It wasn't John Rutledge that stood there and voted yes for independence. Yeah. It was his brother. I think his name was Edward. Okay. It, there were brothers. Yeah. He didn't. He he was like Dickinson. He stood out and didn't yeah, do it. Yeah. But they 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 felt like the the unanimity of the vote needed to be there, even though New York abstained because yeah. they didn't have the information from the the state or something. I did like how they included that in there. This little bit of like dumb like this, like parliamentarian ephemera. I don't know. I just sort of enjoyed that. Yeah. Well, I really. I mean, it's not like I. I do have a copy of Robert's Rules of Order yeah, right. somewhere. Yeah, 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 I don't have it because that's real nerd shit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but it, 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 I like the the pageantry of it, mm-hmm. the, the 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 ceremony of it. I think. Do you think I didn't look this up? Do you think Washington would have been there in that room when uh, Adams turned to him and made him the commander of the Continental Army? Mm. It's something I don't I don't know. Um, he hadn't yet gone to Cambridge. Yeah. If you go. We were in Boston this summer, and Brittany and I went around in in Cambridge and around mm-hmm. Harvard. And there is there's a whole space right out there across from the cemetery, right kitty corner from Harvard, and it's um, where George Washington mustered the troops right there. So he did leave Virginia, leave Philadelphia, yeah. and go up there and and get the troops organized. Yeah. So, but I don't know. I, I don't know the, the, the they're playing so fast and loose. With I know. The time. Yeah. Well, that's why it, it's hard. That's to why tell. when you're like we're, we're kind of skipping around, like. Are we though? <laughs> They're skipping. You know, uh, Even if we follow their timeline, we're skipping. We're, around. That's what I mean. Yeah. Speaking of George Washington, real fast, played by the great David Morse, who like Green Mile, Green Mile, uh, 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 Thirteen Monkeys. Uh, oh yeah. Um, 
he was in the second season of True Detective. He's one of those guys that every time he shows up. Do you want to talk about the no. second season of True Detective? No, no. no I, I don't. <laughs> I Which one was the, that? That was the that was the one no one liked. That was the one with Colin Farrell. I don't think I saw it. Oh, okay, that is worry. that the one with uh, the libertarian? Yes, uh, yes, yeah, what's yeah, his name? Yeah, um, the Vince Vaughn. Wedding crap. Vince Vaughn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's how I remember. That's how you Vince remember. Vaughn. Yeah, that's how you remember. <laughs> Uh, but David Morse, I love him every time he shows up. I always forget his name. Uh, but he is one of those guys that whenever you see, you're like, oh, yeah, he's going to bring it. Um, and uh, The Rock, he's incredible in The Rock. Oh, he's um, a, does he have the ponytail in The Rock? Because he plays something where he's got a ponytail. That is in, uh, that, that's in 12 Monkeys. Oh, okay. 12 Monkeys. 12 Monkeys? God, now I can't remember. The, Brad Pitt, Bruce Willis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great yeah, movie. Yeah. Great Terry, movie. Terry Gilliam, but it's something Monkeys. Well, anyway, yeah, I think it is uh, too. yeah, that's that's but no, he, he he plays like a tough military guy in The Rock, like like here. The nose is a little Leonard Bernstein, Bradley Cooper ish yeah, for me. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that, but you know, like I think Dave Morris is actually very tall. I think he is like six foot five and just like a big guy. Yeah, yeah, and so like he gets that that sort of imposing Washington, and, and he get, he also gets that kind of that Washington didn't really have politics. He was kind of a, he, his thing, he, his politics was his own personal virtue, yeah, et cetera. I, I think so. I think it, it, like standing in for the, to, to, to be the virtue or lead yes. the virtue of the nation. Yes. But he, he was certainly not a Jeffersonian. No, um, no, he, he was a total. Eventually wick. he found politics. Yeah, the, yeah. He was a federalist for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. hundred percent. Yeah, 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 no, absolutely. But in this moment, I think he was, th there's a scene between he and John Adams where he's he's talking about, he, oh, the armband. Mm -hmm. And he's like, are you in mourning? And he goes, yeah. I'm getting emotional. What a douche. He, he goes, yeah, I'm in mourning. I'm for the, for the, the Massachusetts, he calls them, yeah. who died. I'm, I'm here for them and I'm, I'm mourning for them. And that, that's, I don't know how accurate that is or whatever, but that, you know, I, you know me, I get swept away. You do. It's, ad <laughs> it's adorable. I get swept away by the, by the, the patriotism and the, all of these, these jingoistic, I'm that I'm the target audience. For you that. are. No, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Like, I love that you are emotionally the target audience you also just like physically look like a guy who would be the target audience you just have that like, <laughs> i look like a republican yeah 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah it's we like tell that when we moved here i told Brittany when we moved to dc because we moved from orange county california which is you know uh we have ronald reagan national airport here only because it's the republicans foisted that on the people at yeah. dc uh which was an absolute disgraceful slap in the face it's John Wayne Airport in Orange County. Hell, I mean, it's hell yeah. it's as Republican as it gets. Yeah. So when we moved here, I told Brittany, I was like, man, it, Trump, he got single digits in the 2020 election here. Like, he, there's no Republicans here. Yeah. And then our next door neighbor was a fucking Republican. But we always have to tell people when we meet them, yeah. we know what we look like. Yeah. We know where we moved from. We know we're originally from Idaho. We're not Republicans. Yeah, yeah. it's like, I promise I'm not an FBI agent. <laughs> yeah. I swear to God. <laughs> yeah. So the episode ultimately ends with the Declaration of Independence having been, uh, getting written and then signed. But there, for me, maybe the best scene, the most telling scene Absolutely in great. this episode was Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and John Adams in a room. And this actually did happen. Did it? Okay. I didn't yeah. know that. Where they, in fact, I, it's something I want to talk about. And I'm going to have to talk about this episode because next episode we move on and the mm -hmm. declaration is no more talked about. But they're starting to pick apart and edit the Declaration of Independence because it wasn't like this is he turned it in and then they signed it and that was it. Yeah. There was like he um, he the, the word self evident was was put in there and I don't know who made those edits if it they was make the it, group they make it seem like it's Franklin yeah it, it was certainly Which I love that scene yeah, by the way it was a group effort to edit it but they did talk to him about it and they like they removed all the the slavery stuff which wasn't really people give Thomas Jefferson a bunch of credit for putting in the Declaration of Independence a, a nod against slavery but it wasn't necessarily against slavery that paragraph or that section. It was blaming slavery on King George, even though he himself owned hundreds of human beings yeah. as property. Yeah, and we talked about it last time. He 
They still left in the whole engine removal part. Right. <laughs> yeah. is, I, would, I would call that a bit of a black mark, personally. But they, they, he, he does a great job. Um, what's his name? Stephen Delane. So, Stephen Delane. You can just call him. Uh, you can just call him Baratheon. Oh, Baratheon. You can just do that. <laughs> I don't know that Stannis. show very well. Yeah. So uh, he does a great job of playing nervous, a little fidgety, a little bothered, maybe even like melding into depressive about the fact that they're picking apart his opus, like this thing that he toiled. Every word was intention. Can I be real with you? Yeah, yeah. I'm like the same way as that when someone's, oh, really? when someone's editing my stuff. I because like, <laughs> I you know I don't mean to toot my own horn. But I'm a pretty good writer, and as people are going through it, like I do that same thing where I will sort of pace and yeah, ask, yeah. and then when they make suggestions, I'll be like, yeah, it's a great idea. Have you considered the, the <laughs> this really like? I think you'll find that like I had a certain like 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 if maybe not when you're reading it, but if you say it out loud, it actually has a sort of uh, lyricism. Maybe maybe you should, you should just just try it out. So so no, I I, I, think I, I used that. to be that way. Uh, I I don't write as much anymore, but <laughs> that's very. It's very. I'm glad you identify with I Thomas did. Jefferson I, so much. I did. That's great. No, there is the. It was look, look. There were three. Look. There are three guys there. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do John Adams. Obviously, that's just not my my energy. So I'm not gonna do that. I love the energy Franklin's bringing. I love a fat guy who's bald and has a ponytail and has a lot of sex. Like something about that is like very charming to me. But again, that, I can't. That's not me either. So of the three, it's the foppish dandy. That's who I'm going with. Well, the 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 story that I want to relay is, and you are most certainly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We should. Maybe for the finale, we'll dress in colonial garb and crank up the heat in here and be yeah, all sweaty and yeah, city. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have sort of ruffles coming out. <laughs> right. yeah. Just go buy a pirate costume. Yeah, yeah. Um, th there's a story that was relayed to Thomas Jefferson, and this is uh, while the, 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 they're, they're just carving the Declaration of Independence into its final form in, in the, the Continental Congress. And Thomas Jefferson's in the corner of the room, and he's brooding, and he's doing the thing. He's pacing, he's nervous, he's bothered, he's, he's being plunged into despondency. And, and, and Ben Franklin comes up to him, and he tells him a story. Mm -hmm. One of his folksy, fucking campy bullshit stories yeah. that is supposed to be an allegory or a message about something else. And it's about a guy named John Thompson who is opening a, a hatter store. Mm -hmm. And he says... Uh, he he wants a sign to indicate to the customer base what it is. And he, so the sign says, John Thompson Hatter makes and sells hats for ready money with a figure of a hat that followed. It says subjoined. That it just means it after. Mm. And so he goes to his friends and he says, hey, give me some advice on this sign rather than have it be John Hatter. John Thompson Hatter makes and sells hats for ready money. Yeah. Uh, and, and so the guy says, uh, well, you don't need to say makes hats because if you're a hatter, they know you make hats. And then another guy says for ready money. Well, it's, you're not charity. You're not, you're not giving away the hats. They know you're selling hats. If you don't have to say for ready money. Yeah. And so then ultimately all it, it gets all the way pared down to where it's just John Thompson with a picture of a hat. Right. <laughs> So he tell he conveys this story, this stupid story, to Thomas Jefferson to try to like assuage his misery witnessing the carving up of the Declaration of Independence because he he really did. I mean, he had he was prone to depression. Yeah, he was a you know a, a, a depressive character. Sure. No offense to Franklin, but I kind of am, I understand the point of the story a bit. Well, it's but, because you identify with Thomas yeah, Jefferson. Yeah, yeah, but like, is he saying that like, hey, but like the point of the story is that like too many editors like destroy the thing eventually, right? <laughs> and so they're saying, don't worry, just like this old folksy story where this guy's like hat store thing got just edited into nothing. That's what's going to happen to your document. Yeah, I, I guess. I guess. I just like, thanks, bro. Appreciate it. Well, it is. It, and this, by the way, that's not just like folklore. This is from... Uh, in, in, in extract from Thomas Jefferson anecdotes of ben, Benjamin Franklin written in December 4th, 1818, yeah. which was uh, eight years before he died or so. Yeah. So th this is, you know, yeah. no, a I'm, real, yeah, this is, this it's is, not is, apocryphal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I did want to talk about, unless there's something about the independence that, that you, that yeah. you have to go, no. uh, is 
another set of scenes where they really make an example of what the time was like. Yeah, yeah. Inoculation. Yeah, it's weird way to end the show because it's kind of out of nowhere. It's not, there's nothing that connected it to what was happening before, I guess, other than the show that well, she's alone. They did a little bit because when they toured the, 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 the campsite, the bivouac site mm-hmm. of the troops, like all these guys are languishing with sores. They've got smallpox. Yeah. It's just, a lot of people don't know this. And when the pandemic first started, I, I, I talked about this as a rebuttal to Republican idiots who act like you can't force uh, vaccinations on people. Mm-hmm. George Washington did exactly that. Yeah. There was a requirement to be inoculated for smallpox to be in the army. He, he made the troops do it. And it wasn't even safe like our vaccines are. People fucking die. Oh, yeah. Because they're they're literally, and this is the scene with the kids, he goes out to his, his wagon filled with dying people and scrapes off pus and blood. <sighs> From, from their sores, yeah, and then not, goes yeah. in and cuts their arms and then jabs it I in there. I do not like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, gross. I, I, yeah, it is extreme. <laughs> Have you noticed that the Adams family is a stand-in a lot for, like, how bad it was back then? Like, yes. anytime they need to show just some horrific medical, like, malady or, like... We get to that later. Yeah, we do. With the yeah, daughter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, it... it but it also really talks about the time that, like, they don't talk about it in the show, but they do in the book here, that during the summer times, very frequently, they would have planned exodus from the cities because of smallpox and yellow fever, because it was just fucking disease left he and right, cr- Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. He, like, because I've recently, Jesse knows this, audience, I'm sure you're going to be very shocked about this. I've become a Napoleon guy of late. I've been reading a lot of Napoleon. And, and as part of that, I've been reading about the slave uprising in Haiti. And, like, one of the things I didn't know is basically part of the reason it worked was yellow fever. Mm. And every time, because the French tried to take it back, the British tried to take it, the Spanish tried to take it. And they would just get it. sick. They couldn't we stand an army. Literally would wipe out, half the army would die. And then the half that survived would be sick. And then it was endemic of of the the population, the native population yeah. in in Haiti. Yeah, they were fine. Yeah, they, they, it was like a cold to them. Yeah. But yeah, no, it like we're talking just tens upon tens of thousands of people died each. Like, and they knew it. They had to. Yeah. Well, that's why they had to come with yeah. numbers. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it, it is a for me. It's one of the things I really admire about the show that they get right that they talk about is just what a hellscape. Yeah. And how much better things are yes. in 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 perspective in comparison. It, um, <laughs> being sweaty, be, having perfumed stinky crotch, not great. Just like any time in any, not just the show, but other shows where they show them just like having to use the bathroom. I'd be like, you know what, I'm done. You know what? <laughs> where where is the hemlock? I'm good. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's uh. It's, I don't know what kind of, award, maybe we should do this, maybe talk about it a little bit next time, if there was any awards or nominations for this show. But makeup oh, yeah. certainly was a production element. The other yeah. thing that they still do very badly ah, yes. are the Dutch angles the Dutch or whatever angles you call them. For no purpose. In fact, I will, I'll put up some screenshots. Yeah. I'll just go and get some screenshots. I'm worried about copyright stuff. That's why we're not playing clips from the show. Because mm-hmm. I don't want the, the mighty heft of HBO to come crashing down on us. Max. Yeah, Max. Oh, yeah, it's yeah. it's not even HBO at all it's now. Even, well, I think it's like a brand of Max. Mm. Yeah, the flattening of everything's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I'll throw in some screenshots so we can some of the things that we're talking about. Yeah, I don't even need to say it. I guess I'll say it to the audio audience because you can go and look, watch it on YouTube. Yeah, and see what we're talking about. Hey, we would love your participation in talking about this. If you are an expert or an avid, uh, someone of int- has interest in this topic, um, 714-576-4054. That's the number for the Dollar More Daily, but we're going to use it for this. You can also email us assets that you'd like us to talk about. Assets? I don't know. Ooh. That Screenshots. Sounds, that's what I was sexual. thinking. <laughs> or just you can email a voice memo from your smartphone to info at johnadamspodcast.com. Is there anything else? No, you hit everything I wanted to hit. I think... Uh, I we think are pretty simpatico in our is. taking it, of the notes. It, it, we're simpatico <laughs> in taking of the notes. We're also like... Our brains both just kind of fly all... This is it. I mean, what's nice about this is this is what it's like to get dinner with us. It's just like... I Or maybe it's what's fucking miserable. It, well... <laughs> 
to that end, uh, Jesse and I got dinner with uh, Brittany and our friends Colin and and Barb and my girlfriend Catherine. And, you know, I think what we also have in common is we, we come off pretty smart. Right, like you have that great voice, like you can talk, you can make a, reading a menu sound like a you know, oh, great. moon landing, <laughs> and so you have that 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 presence. I don't have that, but I I through like my education or just whatever else, I I interest I come, in the topic. I come off as erudite, and yeah, I know yeah. that, right? But like we started talking about the show to our friends, and within fifteen seconds, <sighs> well, wee, 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 wee. well, there was that, but then. <laughs> But then, independently, both you and I started talking about the guy's dick we saw in the episode before. Right. Just out of nowhere, our the brains immediately feather. went to that. Yeah. <laughs> this is we're all yeah. So, so yeah. So that I think this like is a good example of what it's like being. Around it's us funny before. you mentioned the dinner that we just had because Brittany and I just talked about it on episode nine hundred nine of the podcast of I Doubt It podcast. Mm-hmm. Coming down the stairs and seeing the Ivanka, oh, yeah, yeah. Donald, Jared Kushner, Kellyanne Conway poster. Yeah. We talked about it. And I put screenshots up. <laughs> on, in in, uh, in on my, I, I suggested the restaurant. In my defense, there was a Hillary poster right next door. There was. So, yeah. They're really, they're so really that going was, for it. So that was the two sides talking that we needed. That's it. There you it know? is. There it is. There. Full circle, everybody. <laughs> Full circle. Ben, Compromise. Ben Franklin is smiling at us. He lives. He lives. S- syphilis filled grave. We will see you next time on episode three to talk about episode three. And uh, I believe this is when they go to France. My fa- my favorite episode. In this is series. it? Yeah, I love the French stuff. All right. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, we appreciate you. And we will see you next time. I'm Jesse Dollimore. I'm Ian Brinkson. And we will see you next time. Bye, everyone.